as I mentioned, you know, I've been a career uh, banker. My bank, uh, my career started in 19, uh, 2000, uh, in uh, 1975 uh, with Citibank, and I've been a banker for 30 years. Uh, and in 2005, finally, uh, when I retired from banking, and the reason I retired was I was very keen to start. Uh, financial institution which provided finance to the unbanked or underbanked, you know. And uh, so I, at that time, uh, looked around and because I had no clue, I had a lot of experience actually. I mean, I'd, I'd gone through the entire gamut of banking and I'd spent a number of years on the retail uh, or consumer banking. And it started in, in India in 1985. Uh, when Citibank launched the consumer bank targeting the middle class. And from 85 onwards, what I saw, how, uh, you know, financial inclusion, I mean, before 85, very frankly, I don't think even middle class had financial inclusion. We had those savings accounts with what I call the bitcoins, you know, you had, you had those brass coins, you had to go and withdraw money, etc. You know, I mean, that was not financial inclusion, you know. Financial inclusion, by what we mean financial inclusion is that all the financial services which a segment requires uh, is provided to that, you know, whether it's loans, deposits, investment, insurance, whatever, you know. 85 onwards, a uh, number of, uh, sorry, uh, you know, 85 onwards, uh, Though it was started by foreign banks like Citi and HSBC, subsequently, you know, private sector banks came in, public sector banks, number of institutions came in, and it took about 15 to 20 years to real, have real financial inclusion for the middle class. So that had, act, and I saw that impact, and I saw how not only the middle class lives were changed, but also in terms of the Indian economy the pent-up demand of 200 million middle class which was released led to the kind of growth which we saw in, in India. So, in my mind, I thought, you know, as a financial service professional, if uh, we could do something for, uh, you know, the unbanked and underbanked, which is maybe estimated around 500 to 600 million people, we would see similar kind of changes. So, that's what drove me. And that took me to first Grameen Bank. And uh, Grameen Bank uh, had a program called uh, the Dialogue Program where we went and spent a week and at the head office uh, for a few days. And then we went to the field and spent a few days at the branch. And we actually saw how uh, microfinance worked. And at that time also, if you want, if wanted any kind of support, uh, Grameen Bank had Grameen Trust, and you could apply to Grameen Trust for uh, financial support or technical support. Yeah. So that's what we did. So that was one aspect. It gave, gave me a very good exposure to, uh, you know, microfinance, which I had no clue as a banker. And then uh, I came here and I called up a guy called Vijay Mahajan, you know, who was the leader of microfinance in India. And I got his name and he is running basics in Hyderabad. And uh, I told him that, you know, I was a banker and I was keen to run. And he invited me over to uh, Hyderabad and we went to, I went to Hyderabad, saw his operation in the head office then attended one of the board meetings of uh, the local area bank he had and finally I went to Raichur and spent a few days in one of the branches and again looked at uh, how microfinance worked in India. The third was here in Bangalore there was an institution called Sangamitra which is still there you know and that time uh, I mean it was run by a very a veteran uh, called Al Fernandez. And again, I spent about a month uh, with them 
to see how microfinance actually works on the ground. And that's how I basically learned about uh, microfinance. So uh, I think one of the things I'd just like to highlight, uh, unlike in commercial world where it's extremely competitive from where I originally come, the traditional commercial world, in this industry there was a lot of sharing of uh, knowledge and experience, you know. And the interest was actually not just narrowly focused on how successful Grameen Bank is going to be, or how successful Basics is going to be, or how successful Sangamitra is going to be, but these people were interested in developing an industry. So there is a place for competition and there is a place for cooperation and learning, you know. And that is something which is was quite unique to me from a learning point of view. Uh, you know, when I entered the uh, microfinance world. Subsequently, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, uh, the culture has always been to share uh, success. You know, I mean, if you have a successful program and you run something uh, well, within the industry, we are always open to, uh, you know, others to come in, even the competitors to come in and come and learn from us, you know, uh, what you can call success transfer, you know, and I think that's one of the best ways to learn and develop an industry. So we, in Ujjivan, always follow that policy. Anyone wants to come and learn something from us, whether it's technology, product, human resource management, whatever it is, you know, uh, they are always welcome to come, spend some time and learn. So that's an, like an ongoing application process in success transfer. So that's uh, basically the kind of culture which we have. And uh, you know, recently uh, someone was doing a write-up uh, on Vijay uh, and he called me up and said, can you talk to the reporter? And I told him that you know, my experience was when I went to Grameen Bank, it was like a university and of course it's very structured, you know, and you have to pay for that seven days, etc. So it's done through a grant and uh, there are, you know, the grant, but it's like a university, you know, and uh, you have to pay for it uh, it's, uh, because it costs some money uh, to, you know, help people uh, uh, learn. Uh, whereas basics was more like an open university, you know. You could just go there, you know. It's like uh, whenever, and I think <laughs> there are a lot of basics graduates here and all across the industry. So that's been my broad experience. I can talk about uh, the other stuff later. Thank you. I worked for many years for 10 years in a place called Moon Karanshan with Union Trust. From there, I learned a lot of. Uh, you know, the strengths of global communities in India. Because I had grown up in Mumbai and uh, Bombay, as it was called then, and one thought that everything is in Bombay. And because people, you see people coming from all over the country to Bombay uh, to, to make a living there. But going and, and spending time in this remote village called Lokaransar in Western Pakistan on the border, I got to see amazing strengths of rural communities. I mean, there were problems, not to romanticize. There were problems about lack of education, lack of access to health. But they're amazing, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, uh, way in which they conserve natural resources, in which uh, uh, they build upon traditional craft, uh, agricultural practices in that very desert. <coughs> I read zone, which, you know, if you go there, you see what grows here, what people are growing. Food, they were going further, uh, and of course the amazing craft heritage of the Rajasthan. And so Ramasutra basically uh, uh, was an, uh, is an attempt to, to create an organization which, which uh, basically ensures sustainable, regular employment with fair wages to rural artisans where they are. A lot of them are still in their homes, working from homes from their homes. So out of the you know, uh, 3,500 plus artisans we work with, 90% still work out of their homes. But very early on we realized that there were some processes we needed to centralize 
if we were going to be uh, you know catering to a market which demands certain standards, one was of course dyeing, dyeing of yarn, dyeing of fabric. The other was uh, tailoring. So it was only in supply and garments. The body size has to be a middle and a small. So there were certain things we had to, uh, certain processes we had to centralize. So, uh, but home-based work continues to be available for most of our artisans that we work with. So one of the key things we realized right in the beginning was that uh, we needed to make investment in, uh, put a lot of effort in product development because. Traditionally, what happens is craft is, uh, well, not, maybe not many years ago, but recently what has happened, craft has become more of a decorative thing in Indian homes. So, um, and then, you know, the people, the craftsmen are based in rural areas, or you know, they sold in village hearts, they knew what, what people wanted, they got feedback, this is not the right size, this is not the right shape, but when their customers were far off, they, they, they could not get this feedback. So we realized we needed to put in a lot of investment in product development and that continues to be one of our key, uh, which is replicated wherever we work. And the amount of range that is, you know, uh, that is made in rural India but for the urban global citizen. Because as it happens today, most of the people who can afford to buy uh, handmade um, products are, are not in villages. They are mostly in towns and cities all over the world. So that's one. The second thing that uh, that is very crucial to our working from the very beginning when we started Ram Sutra, we decided it should be a for-profit organization. Although I come from a not-for-profit background, uh, and the reason for this was very uh, clear was that you know there had to be a people had to to have a stake. In, in the sense of putting their money where their mouth was because otherwise the tendency is that you have so many programs that are churned out by everyone, government, non-government. So people tend to think, okay, so I'll come for a training program, I'll get a stipend. I'll come for something. So the, the, the value rate was not there. So we managed to convince when we started because it was an area where I had worked in with the Mughal Trust. Uh, we managed to convince a thousand artisans who put in a thousand rupees each and that's how our company got its first money. So that was 10 lakhs of capital that uh, artisans put in. Having done that, I was very nervous and I said, you know, I mean, I, this, is, uh, this is a huge responsibility on me. So and I said I should also put in money. I had no money, no savings. So uh, I, did, I asked, I, did, I borrowed from friends and family, put in another 10 lakhs and that's how we started the company. And I must say that, that uh, really uh, made a, uh, you know, a mindset change in me. I would think a hundred times before even putting a small ad in the paper for an exhibition we were holding. I would say, is it worth paying so much rent for our office because this is you know, they said this is not something I've written and got a grant from because earlier we, we had tried to get grants but or tried to get support from banks but you know how it is when you start up, no one believes that you are going to make this, uh, it's going to run. So that that is something we encourage all the artisan groups that we work with across, uh, you know, now we work in four different states that even if not right in the beginning but as we work with them and uh, ensure that they get orders and get work through us that at some point they will become shareholders in our, in our company. So from those 1000 now we have 2200 artisans who are shareholders. From Rajasthan we have also moved to Eastern Uttar Pradesh. We also do some work in Bengal and most recently in Manipur. So of course the challenges are different in, in different parts uh, of the country. Also it depends on the crafts. For example, a craft like weaving is, is, is uh, you know, weaving fabric is what? It's a science, it's an art, it's a craft, it's everything. I mean, so you have to get, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Whereas something that needs to be a on the surface like embroidery is relatively simpler because you already have the base. One thing that we, um, apart from the ownership and investment in product development, 
A third thing we found very useful and we tried to let me, it is a yes has to be done everywhere, is what you know we realized very early on that uh, uh, that uh, no human resources, that <coughs> we, we were getting orders, we did not have a problem getting orders, frankly. We, we decided we would go the wholesale route and work with retailers because there was a way we couldn't set up shops, we didn't have that kind of bandwidth or experience. So uh, we got orders but we were unable to fulfill them on time and then that resulted in the, the buyer losing trust and losing faith and all. So we invested in something called, in, in a group of, in a, what should I say, cadre of people called craft managers. And these are artisans from the village, village base, who are at least fifth or eighth standard pass, if they are more that's better. Uh, and we train them from the beginning, both classroom as well as on the job training, in how to handle production and quality in the village. Because that is the most crucial part, you know, timely delivery and quality delivery, that's our motto. Somewhere it will or suffice it. Till today we struggle with that and that remains because, because you know, I mean, especially when you work in the textile industry where where everything like something has to reach in time for Diwali or New Year or whatever. And someone sitting in a village far off doesn't realize the urgency of it three months before. So that's something, uh, so, so this uh, this has enabled us to sort of build a grassroots cadre of managers from bottom up. And that is our real uh, strength we find and we wish to. Of course, the challenges that we face remain this whole thing of combining social and economic goals, how do we grow without compromising on our uh, four values, which is respect for both the producer and the customer. That That is a line I got from Amul, which I'm very influenced by, respect for both the producer and the customer. And that, that remains, uh, that guides us. As, as we mentioned earlier, 18 years, uh, out of I may look uh, <coughs> pretty old uh, in, in this attire and, and with this hairdo, but uh, the fact is that I have spent most of my, my years with uh, as, as an entrepreneur. So I have not had the, uh, the advantage of learning elsewhere. Uh, I, I did not realize that earlier, but uh, <coughs> there are a lot of mistakes which one tends to make as an entrepreneur, which can be very costly. Uh, if you don't learn your lessons early, uh, and with me it was like maybe uh, high on uh, energy, uh, looking at maybe every problem, uh, believing that every problem has a solution and that solution exists uh, in this world and, and, and capable of achieving and maybe fulfilling or maybe uh, solving a particular problem. That was the belief in which I had started. I'm a, I'm a typical case of uh, an individual who was driven by, by the lust of money. I was an entrepreneur. Uh, not even like an iota of social uh, was in me, and I uh, came to know this world much later. Uh, but at, at one point of time, I uh, was, on, was a dropout uh, from my college, and I was uh, uh, dabbling in the stock market. I was uh, a jogger. I was the one who used to uh, raise cards and, and, and uh, take the best price uh, from, from different uh, buyers. So from there, uh, after the Hashat Mehta uh, thing happened, I, I learned that it was not me who was, uh, was smart enough to raise the value of stocks, my own portfolio, my limited portfolio, which I had pulled in uh, with the help of my friends who still uh, are not uh, as friendly as they were earlier. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that I, I learned my lesson that unless I really understand how to add value, uh, uh, dabbling the stock market, becoming rich, was uh, the shortcut which was which was not the way to for me to go, and and then I did my masters from uh, from Delhi University, and uh, but the, the seed of entrepreneurship was already sown. So it was for me uh, solving uh, the problem for others, but mostly like solving problems for me myself. And already having a big car, a big house, uh, a beautiful wife. So these were the things that were at the top of my agenda. When I uh, became an entrepreneur, I didn't have capital, so that was, uh, I think that's, that's common to most uh, people uh, who think of, uh, who have this big dream 
who come from a middle class background. So I uh, started training. I, mean, I had learned some bit of internet way back in 95 uh, at Lee School, and I started training people in internet uh, education. Can you, can you imagine that maybe there would be a training course for internet today? Uh, everyone is an expert. So at that time, I had the advantage that I knew a little bit, and others did not know anything. And everyone was so passionate about internet. So when I used to open that Yahoo, uh, I, I think it was yes, it was Yahoo or something. And I was there. So it was like, oh, I feel I was uh, surprised that it was almost like magic, and I was a magician. And I, I did earn uh, some bit of money there, but then I, I was uh, wise enough to, uh, to go into different fields of, uh, of training, a website development, wrote the dot com bubble yeah, in, in 2000. Uh, thankfully, it didn't come down with it because uh, by that time, what happened was that. I, I had a small car, not a big car, a second hand small car. I had a rented house, uh, didn't have a wife still, but I, I realized that uh, most of the earlier ambition which was driving me was more or less I could be fulfilled. I didn't have the same urge that I had five years uh, earlier. And then, uh, but that energy was still in me. I, mean, I, was, I was still as restless as, as early, but I, I, at that point of time, I was looking for something which was which could really uh, take care of my energy. I mean, frankly, I need very happy uh, running away from the activity operations of the business now when I look back. But the point was that I, I, I felt that maybe there was a larger purpose and, and what could be that, something which could drain my energy from morning to evening and, and for me to kind of have a good night's sleep. So what happened was in, in uh, late 1999, I was invited by uh, more as a website developer. I was invited by the district uh, uh, collector of Dha, which was a small district uh, bureau in Bar, uh, to develop uh, a website for a for a project that they were launching. And this project was called Gyanbun. I don't know if any of you would recall that it was a long time back. Very, it became a big success later, won a lot of awards. But our job was to just build a website. And when I went there. Yeah, I was not even kind of, I didn't have any business to go to the village and I didn't go to the village because for me it was a rather a client paying me some money. Uh, it so happened that the client was government and then getting money from them was very difficult. So I had to go back uh, again and again uh, to get that money from them. But in the process what happened was that the, the core business of Gyanbut was e-governance. And they were setting up a computer at the panchayat end and that computer uh, was connected through some intranet application. Uh, to a central server at the DIDA uh, office uh, of the district uh, collectorate. And this uh, was the link for basically Gravans. So Gravans redress it. Someone could type in a, uh, an application that the teacher is not coming on time, the hand pump is not working, um, uh, that the school building needs repair, and a lot of Gravances. So the, the district collector, and especially the, the, um, uh, the head of the DIDA, was very dynamic, and he thought that maybe a a simple internet application could work. And our job was still the website development. So I was very happy to develop the website and it over to them. I used to go there time and again to uh, get 15,000 rupees uh, <coughs> the cost of developing the website. And then one day what happened was just before the inauguration by uh, the chief minister was to happen, the, uh, the internet guy who had not done his job, the internet guy, the one the guy who was supposed to make the software, he vanished. And he just kind of he, he decided to leave, perhaps he was, uh, he was he was not as patient as I was uh, for the money. So he uh, said that, uh, I, I have nothing to do with you, you manage your inauguration and your software and I'm going. And then there was a complete crisis because the inauguration was supposed to happen, the software was not ready. And within three days, the, <laughs> the poor guy, the district collector, he uh, asked me at uh, about 10 in the night that I just finished my work, I had to go back, said that, can you help us? And looking at him, and I thought that maybe what will happen to my website and what will happen to my money. So I might as well kind of help him. And I, we the, put together something which was very sketchy, but good enough for the chief minister to press the button and everyone to clap that okay, this inauguration was done. <laughs> but that took me to the village. For the first time, I went to the village, back to the village. I was I spent a lot of time as, as a kid in the village. And when I went back, the enthusiasm of people, I mean, that technology was so simple, it was so simple, I thought that maybe they are fooling everyone, but the point was that you could still uh, get a mail, a very simple uh, five lines transferred from a village to a district headquarters, which was so simple. It looked like maybe 
why would anyone uh, care so much about this? But the moment I went to the village, I realized the value of, of that very simple application. And, and frankly, that night I could not sleep. And uh, moving forward, somehow I realized that that was where I should spend my time. I should kind of maybe uh, give my life for something like that, which could which should solve problems. And that was where I felt that like, my energy can be uh, can be drained because if that simple application could solve a problem, there would be so many more things that could be done. And uh, so this, this uh, one minute uh, uh, would be like, okay, I think my colleagues have been pretty generous, so they have given me two minutes of their time, so I could take uh, four more minutes, I will not take more than five minutes. I was still a very uh, hardcore entrepreneur, very, very business-like, but started looking at the social aspects of technology. And from 2000 to 2003, we built a brand, won a lot of awards, and, and we were at the top of the world believing that we have, we have solved most of the problems. Uh, the governance uh, system uh, started to reciprocate. There were a lot of people who started to look at e-governance as, as a solution. And in uh, uh, 2003, we had uh, uh, a few kiosks, about 96, 100 of them, which were solving some problems. And the good part was that the government started to take very active interest. They set up an e-governance cell within the Ministry of IT which was uh, focused on providing gov government services at the village level. We, the moment someone else started replicating it, my interest was, was lowered. Because if it is happening, why should I be where like, there would be a problem with already being solved? So what, the, what was the next thing? I had about 100 entrepreneurs and I had to kind of look for some, some very interesting activity for them also. So I started looking at computer education. I had the computer, I had an entrepreneur, I had a trained entrepreneur back then, the guy who knew more about computers than me, more about internet than me. So why, why can't he uh, or she provide uh, basic computer education literacy to people there? And uh, so that started to work and that model started to work in terms of expansion because I was no longer, I didn't need a, an MOU with the government and we were not charging any money from them, but we didn't need an MOU from the government to get to a new village. That took us to places in Assam, UP, uh, Bihar. Uh, 2006, we had about 1,000 such centers. The yeah, investments poured in, and I was, again, like, I felt that we have done it. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a true entrepreneur. And by that time, Ashoka had given me this tag of social entrepreneur also. So I, I became a social entrepreneur, and I actually kind of, <laughs> that was the first time that I really realized that there was some social. Uh, benefits of the work that I was doing. It was for me. It was still like a business, uh, which was uh, done in the villages. But I, I also kind of uh, could come out of that operational day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities of Drishti, and, and that gave me some opportunity with some money in the bank. I was I was able to spend maybe about two months with my family in the village, where uh, which is my native village, and and, and that was a good turning point. Because I realized that all that we had done, all that we had achieved, all that the praise, the, the awards, was nothing. There was, there was no major impact on the work that we had done. People were still uh, living in poverty. They were still kind of maybe uh, facing challenges. There were still people moving out of the village at, at a pace which was which was too rapid for the village to even kind of sustain themselves. And, and that uh, uh, changed the course. That actually like really changed the course for me as an individual. And then for me, for my organization, it was much more difficult because an organization is is, is like a uh, is, is like a very large truck which takes which does not have a, a, a have small uh, turning radius. It is not like a nano which you can turn very quickly. But uh, it has taken a lot of time uh, to turn to uh, realize the importance uh, of, of uh, what we are trying to say and what I mentioned when I was introducing myself. After that, it is it is all about not about what the world has to offer to the village. It is about what the village needs from the world outside, and I think it's a it's, it's a it's a very small difference, but that difference means a lot for those communities. Till then, I was I was uh, the last mile. I was being considered as the last mile. They delivered products in 2008. We had set up a so supply chain of delivering FMCG products and everything. But the moment the village starts to look at you as the first mile, like what Ramsutra is doing. I mean, that is the time when you, are, when you are really a part of that community, when you are representing them and you are not representing the world who is looking at you to uh, push products, at times even like literally push products, services, communication, 
uh, material, including the government, I would say, the programs, schemes uh, to those communities. But the moment the community uh, starts to expect from you, that's the time when the, when the entire game changes. And then I think that this new game that we have been playing for the last six years has not won us many awards, thank you. But uh, if we smile at PC uh, in the face of uh, Malaysia, it's, it's a big award. So, so that's not a very short introduction, but yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to both of you also.